So there's five parts to this story. And the first part of the story is I went to Japan about two years ago, just about to the day, to study standardized work with Mr. Asayo Kato, who was the HR advisor to Ono during the 50s through the 80s. And one of the, and I left with a very, uh, a couple of robust impressions that he left in my mind. And one of them was this statement that I'd seen before, didn't really understand it that well, but I certainly started to when I left and um, through practical application have developed since. Without work standards, there will be no standardized work. And the fact that standardized work is not a pile of documents on people's desks. So that was part one of the story. Part two of the story, I walked in, and some of you who have seen my previous webinars on the, uh, the step up reference model will know what I'm talking about here. So I walked into a shift change one morning at, a, at the winery about 15 minutes from here, from me, from the office. And the two shifts incoming and outgoing were having an, uh, it wasn't an argument, but it was certainly a robust discussion about the hole that's at the end of that twin pack of uh, four litre casks <clears throat> and the location of the hole. The hole's supposed to be there, it was the location of the hole. And one shift was saying it was in the right position and the right size and the other wasn't. And, uh, and one shift had been altering settings on the machine and the other intended not to. So on and so forth. There's a fair bit of backwards and forwards. When I looked at the, the, the standard for that hole, it just said the ends needed to be even. So it was no wonder they were having that argument and discussion. Well, it was, it became an argument in the end. <clears throat> so that allowed uh, some discussion with, with that winery and for me to use the winery as a platform for development, for, for applying a patent for the development of work standards. As you, those of you have seen my previous webinars, you know this story. So Josh, who's the supervisor on the line, you see him there on the right. We picked a machine to focus on and, one, and the first work standard we developed was the output work standard for the machine. And here's the part of the work standard which de describes the location of that hole. So I'm not going, again, I'm not going into the detail except that there's a measurement, A minus B, from the narrowest point, no more than 35 millimetres with no less than one millimetre overhang on both sides. So that was terrific. And I, could, I was walking across uh, past the palletizer with Josh with this document. And I said, I, I, said to, I could almost look, see the look on his face of concern. I said, Josh, how are we going to get these guys to measure this at two in the morning on night shift? How are we going to train people? And I could see that he was starting to think about that and had some concerns. So challenged Josh uh, as how he could do that better. And he came up with this visual, uh, visual device, which you can see there um, under, behind that pack, behind that template is, a, is the pack itself, a different one to the red one you can see on the left. And that green, yellow, red boundary Green, if the hole remains within the green, it's okay. If it goes into the yellow machine, means adjust, needs adjusting, but keep going. If you go into the red, you stop the machine. As soon as Josh came up with that, I thought of this lady, Dr. Gwen Galsworth, who I met in El Paso in 2007, and who I learned uh, about visual thinking, visual workplace from. And the connection, uh, I went straight back and said jo to Josh, you know, with this thing you've got at number four there, how do you think you'll go with this? And Josh's reply was, yep, that'll work. And again, I thought, oh, wow, I wonder what sort of level of opportunity there is here. And I mm. spoke to Lean Frontiers and I said to Lean Frontiers, look, I'd love to do a webinar on this. Mm. And then I thought, why not go to the person, uh, and, and, and just to present this hypothesis really, maybe without visual workplace, uh, without work workplace visuality, quite a bit of work won't become standardized. So I wanted to present on that hypothesis. And then mm -hmm. I thought, why not go to the expert? Why not go to the person who knows far more about this than me, being Dr. Gwen Galsworth, who's the president and founder of Visual Thinking and the Visual Lean Institute. I know that she's been helping companies for a hell of a long time. She's written lots of books, much prefer to get her to talk rather than me. So I emailed Gwen and we've had a, uh, a few backwards and forwards and I would like to welcome Gwen to this webinar and thank you very, very much for joining us, Gwen. Indeed, now, my a, pleasure, just my pleasure, yeah. Now I have a question for you first up, Gwen, and that is, there's a, there's, you and I have discussed this before, the difference between visual workplace and visual management. Can we start with that please and get that yes. right up front? 
Yes, we certainly can. In fact, it's a very important distinction to make because there's a lot of confusion about it. And the confusion uh, has to do with some gaps in our understanding of who we are as humans and how we function. So I'm going to start on a, on a conceptual level and then come down to visual management, visual workplace. But Beautiful. let us establish right now, they are two different things. Visual management is a part of the umbrella called workplace visuality or the visual workplace. And I, I do have a, a diagram to show you in a moment. The important thing to understand is that 50% of our brain function is dedicated to finding and interpreting visual da data. We are sight dominant. 50% of the involuntary part of our brain. The voluntary part is the part that we use in what we learn in school and we exercise that muscle. But the involuntary part happens automatically, like our heartbeat, like our breath. Involuntarily, our brain is compelled 50% of our brain function, which includes all the other involuntary activities of our body, our emotions, that piece, is looking for visual information, spots it, and then interprets it, gives it meaning. When we know that, this is neuroscience, when we know that, we understand that most workplaces do not serve the involuntary part of what our brain is doing all the time. The visual workplace is the presence of what our brain needs. The non-visual workplace is the absence of what the brain needs in order to understand that it is safe, understand, understand what it's supposed to do, and do it and get feedback on itself. So it's a vitally important question for operational excellence and certainly for work standards. So except work when what I understand mm -hmm. you to be saying there, that's brilliant. What I understand you to be saying there is that our brain is going to take in 50% of this information regardless. 50% of the information is going to be visual based. So if we don't have the right visual cues there, we're in trouble. <laughs> Almost exactly. But it means that 50% of our brain is constantly and compelled yeah to find visual information to answer first the survival questions of, am I safe? And then the appropriate questions to our society, what am I supposed to be doing? Am I doing it right? So a non-visual based environment is an environment that is extremely hard for humans to function in, let alone feel safe. They don't feel safe and they don't function very well, but because we're adaptive, we try very hard. Let me give you an illustration of that. If I, I'm going to share my screen now, and I, I just want to illustrate this for you so that you get it. Now, uh, all right. So hopefully you can see a blank screen. Yeah, Oscar? Uh, no, I can see you. Ah, I see. I did not do the proper thing. I thought I hit the share. Hold on. Uh, la -di da ah, we're supposed to hit that. Okay, now, oh, now close we can your eyes. See. Yes, but you should not be seeing all of it. I want to give it to you piece by piece. Okay. Beautiful. Perfect. All right. So here is a two dimensional sign. This is, in a way, a work standard. Powerful, but it's telling me only. This yes. device is visual, but it's telling me what the right behavior is. Slow down, children playing. Contrast that powerfully with the next device that doesn't tell me. It makes me slow down. And that is the difference between visual management that tells me, that monitors, that shows me, and visual performance that makes me. If you only do this, you're not getting an automatic feedback. You're also not making it easy for me as a human to do the right thing. The highest level of that is pokey oak which embeds attributes in the process of work as part of the process of work. This is very, very close to Pokioka, visual guarantee is what I call it. This is called a visual control. We still have choice, but not much. Yeah, so, I, could go, I could still go very fast over that, but it would hurt. Yes, it would hurt <laughs> your struts and, and, and you would notice it, right? It would be irregular. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, that's why it's a But it's built into the very place where you need to slow down. We have to notice that sign that says slow down, and then we have to decide to obey it. We have to care. So there are a lot of other layers of behavior that can get in the way. I'm just going to take you through a little riff because I want to. So this is typical of visual management, and it's important. Just a second, please. Let me just exit this. There we go. It's important. This is what we call monitoring not making. This is monitoring performance. And there's lots of examples. You go onto Google and you find this kind of array. And Google says this, it says visual management is an essential operational tool that links data and outcome. This is true, but what is not correct is what it contains, what, what it, how it continues. That sentence goes on to say, as the name implies, visual management lets you manage everything in your factory visually, not at all true. It is, as you'll see in a moment, about 10%. It has about a 10% impact on your outcomes. And it says, this part is correct. Another sentence that I found in Google, managing visually is the ability of an environment to quickly show the current status of predetermined aspects of the environment. Totally true. That is accurate. But it goes on to say, if done well, visual management helps everyone in your factory understand and know how to fix an issue if something is wrong. Completely incorrect. Yeah, right. it's, it is impossible because, and I'll show you this continuum if I may, please. It'll only please. take a moment. Okay, I thank know you. you're doing well. This is a great answer. Thank you, Gwen. Keep going. Thank you. It's rather complete. So the, the journey of categories of visual function, which is what I've been developing for 30 plus years, categories of visual function creates a continuum. You start up and when you get towards the end, you have a completely transformed business. Culturally, you have instability moving to high performance, self-directed teams because the workplace is constantly speaking to us. Now let's look at those categories of visual function. There they are. Operator-led visuality, visual standards, visual displays, visual management. Mm, let's take a look. This is what I assess, and this is based on almost 40 years of doing this work, as the impact of each of these categories. Here's visual management. Here's the impact. 10%. But that's not bad. Not at all. Look at visual metrics, which is a different kind of KPI. Visual metrics and visual problem solving, 12%. Here we have visual standards. It's there, 8%, but it's a mighty 8%. The work of the TWI Institute is absolutely transformational because if you don't have work standards, you don't have any baseline. Yeah. So this should give us a sense of, yes, visual management is important, but it is not everything. There are many, many other aspects. It's, so It's part of the whole sum. It is, it is. And the whole sum is a workplace that speaks. Yes. And it speaks in the voice of the person who needs the information. That has to do with how you create a workplace that speaks and might be a little bit off our topic today. No, no, it's good. So two things I take out of that. One is that visual, just to confirm, visual management is something that comes, <clears throat> it reports on something, it reports after the activity is done. So visual management is a posting. It reports after the activity is done. Once we have our results, it's making them clear. That's, That's the right. first thing. First thing I understand. And the second thing I understand is don't look too far into Google. <laughs> don't trust. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. You can trust it a little bit, but just don't trust it too much. <laughs> well, I will tell you that the folks who are purporting this are selling the dashboards and selling yeah, right. the mechanisms, and they're doing it innocently. They're not being no, uh, no, mean-spirited, no. or they think that they have the answer, but they don't realize that they're actually dealing with just what managers want to know. And yes. managers are the one who <laughs> invest their millions into dashboards and coordinated KPI systems. Yeah. But for the performance, the performance doesn't happen until you get at least four of these other uh, opportunities opened up. So this will just, mm -hmm. go ahead, please. I think that helps us understand. I mean, we've got to be, 
what I'm also taking out of this is that we've got to be careful of spending a, a lot of money on systems that give us this performance data and falling into the trap of thinking, well, that's the problem solved. It's all going to happen now. <laughs> because we know it will do it. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, it's unfortunate to put that kind of a burden on us humans when we really want to do a good job, but we need, we need a partner and that partner is the workplace itself. That partner is the floor, the benches in the office as well, your desks, the things of the workplace. There's a way of making them speak. And when they speak to you, they become your partner. So you have help you have an army of help from a workplace that speaks and you'll be wildly successful and so will your company lean doesn't do this lean doesn't touch it so gwen it, that segues into the yeah. next point i have down here on my notes so i've got four of them it says and how does it give us some examples please of my, you know you've mentioned that that um visuality builds excitement and interest so can you illustrate this statement through some examples, please. Do you mean examples of standards that have become yes. <clears throat> standards that have yes. become visual? Okay, so I'm yes, taking please. that that little narrow strip of ten percent, exactly, and that narrow strip isn't called work standards; it's called visual standards. So, Excellent. yes, I have. I have. Thank a, you for the clarification. Yes, I'm sorry, but you you know I've I've spent a lot of time making these dissections because. They're the doorway to exactly. implementation. So <clears throat> this is our got definition. No problem with you. I've got no problem with you correcting me, Gwen. You've mm -hmm. always been good at that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our definition of a visual workplace, a work environment that is self-ordering. I'm sorry. Uh, I beg your pardon, but I... Yeah, we can see you now. You need to yes. share your screen. Oh, I'm not sharing. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, you know, Amanda and I, and <clears throat> sorry, Amanda, I've, I have to find that part of the screen that allows okay. me to well, animate. Do you remember where that was? Uh, Gwen, do you see the share screen? Option? Yes, I want to do that, but I'm doing something else first. I'm sorry, I, I switched. So I shall um, do the uh, share screen. Just a moment, please, and I'll do it. Okay. Thank you. Here Oscar, we while we are waiting, there is a question in the chat that asks, how does this differ from Lean? Okay, and, I'll come back. Okay, so we'll come back to that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I am going to beg your pardon for this because I'm looking for a, a setting and how to turn off automatic PowerPoint. Here we go. And I'm going under, all right, forgive me. So I did notice a question while Gwen's looking, I noticed a question earlier about El Paso. So no, I'm in Australia. Um, I'm six hour, uh, sorry, 300 miles west of Sydney, but I flew to El Paso in 2007 yes. with my business partner to attend a week seminar with, um, with Gwen. So that's the, how El Paso comes into the equation. But I will tell you, that uh, two years before that, Oscar wrote me a letter about visuality and he said, I'm interested in learning. I was so blown away by that letter. Everything came out of that, everything, this long relationship. Do you remember that letter? I still I do, have I've it. still got the letter. And the reason I wrote the letter was because, vi uh, this is the truth. The reason, reason I wrote the letter was because visuality made my life easier. I That's read the right. book. Tried that's something right. and thought, wow, my yeah. life just become easier. So that's yeah, why I wrote the letter. Right. It's as simple as that. I hope right, that you can go. see now. Yes, now okay. we can see your screen. All Thank good. you very much. Thank you for your patience. So <clears> this <throat> is a definition of a visual workplace, and it'll get us to standards. It's a work environment that is self-ordering, self-explaining, self-regulating, self-improving. And here it comes, where what is supposed to happen does happen on time, every time, day or night, because of visual devices. It is the devices that hold our intelligence. That's why they partner with us. We take our intelligence, we create a visual device. Of course, there are methodologies for this, but that's the simple formula. What can you is just hold that? Can, can you just hold sure. that thought? Just, sure, sure. And see, that's the interesting thing I find with this um, is that when I did that introduction at the start, that work standard that Josh came up with 
that was maybe going to work. But the reality was it was going to be hard to train. And it was the chances of at two o'clock in the morning on night shift of someone picking up a tape measure and making those measurements, the chances of that, the reality was that was not going to happen. Now, it's still with that template he's got, it's still yeah. the chances of that not happening are still there, but the chances of that not happening are a lot lower by having a template that takes two seconds to use and is sitting there by the machine. Uh, the, the chances of that happening and now are a lot of uh, that check being made are a hell of a lot higher. So the chances is, of what is supposed to happen does happen every time day and night have just gone up a lot via a visual device. And what's so wonderful about visuality and about visual devices is that the visual device will give you feedback on whether or not the device itself is effective enough. You begin exactly. to see the gap, to see the wiggle. And there are ways of making your devices more and more and more powerful by embedding them more and more deeply into the actual process of work. Those are the methodologies. So yep. that was an excellent example. And it's a fantastic beginning. It's so a good let me beginning, just, a great beginning. A great beginning. It's a breakthrough. Yeah. When your operators, when your CEO learns about how to make their and his, her work visual, suddenly they can do their work and they have lots of room for other things like improvement, like a million things. So visuality is, a, is a, a, the perfect partner. I better stay on track. So what is supposed to happen? So what's supposed to happen is your standards. This is from our module called the eight building blocks. And the building block for standards is building block two. Your technical standards and your procedural standards, the what and the how. So that's what you've been doing in TWI. What yes. happens when you make them visual? You get the visual what and the visual how. Powerful, okay? So here's a, an example of a technical standard, which is a value that you need to move the material, the product closer to what the customer wants, okay? And examples are, these are hardcore examples, the ID, the OD. They'll be different in an office. They'll be different in IT. Poor temperature. And here's an example. This is, happens to be in Wodonga, Australia, at Wilson Transformer. This winding mechanism here for winding transformers, winding the copper around it, it requires a certain specification. That is a visual standard of the spec. This is a sizing standard. It's a sizing template. So the spec has been set, the spec has been understood, and then that information is translated into that device, which later on the operator painted red and put in a prominent position. That's what happens when we take a written standard and we make it alive. We make it a device. Now we have a partner. So prior to that, Gwen, I presume they just had a measurement. They, 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 they measured it or prior to that, they eyeballed it because they were expert. Yeah, they guessed right? it. Yeah, you they eyeball eyeballed it. it. Yeah, well you done. You make a mistake, better measure it, get a gauge. This is a gauge. But yeah. this is a gauge for a, 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 that substitutes for an adjustment. And we have this wonderful saying in visuality, turn your adjustments into settings. Turn your adjustments into settings because we haven't talked about it yet. The visual workplace is about taking missing information and putting the answers in place in the form of a visual device, taking information deficits, which by their very nature are invisible, they're deficits, yes. and watching so, our motion. So from the supervisors yes. or whoever, the say the frontline leader in this case, Mm -hmm. Frontline leader's job of training someone how to set up this machine. Previous to this, it was it was the coil goes here, and it's based on experience, as you say, and they'll have learned That's from it. their mistakes. That's Imagine it. how much easier now the training is of this new person. Absolutely, absolutely. And I want to say the magical way of bringing visual devices on the operations level into being, creating a workplace to speak that speaks on the operator level is to teach your operators how to notice information deficits. When they do, they, are, they start producing visual devices, things like this, visual standards by the dozens. 
So, Gawain, because, can I just touch on that? So, yes, please. Be, mm -hmm. Because when you have an operator who's really experienced, right, they're not going to notice that it's hard because for them it's not hard. That's right. So how do you take an operator mm -hmm. who is very good at the job and is experienced who therefore do, doesn't have these gaps because they don't see them because they're good at it and they yes. it naturally happens. How do, you, how do you get a person like that to recognize the gap, the gap in uh, information? That is a great question. And I have an easy, uh, a ready answer for it because, in fact, it's fundamental to transforming your workplace. With your veteran operators, you can give them two assignments. You can say, remember what it used to be like, or watch the questions that you get from the new person. Uh, be yeah, a right. buddy to the new person and have him come and ask you questions and then keep track of that on yes. a memo pad. And every single one of those questions, you know the answer to. So you give the answer and you're polite and you're complete. But then you say, aha, the first question is free. The second time I hear that question, I got to make a visual device or I'll buddy up with the operator and say, hey, let's turn that answer into something that will serve you tomorrow and the next day and the next day and serve second and third shift too. So it's the immediacy of the question that is the, 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 the harvest, the, the orchard of all of the fruits of, of, that will turn into visual devices. That's mixed metaphors. But You've just that's reminded the way me you the do first, it. The first question, the first is, question free is free. Rule. Remember that one? Yeah. I do. I'd forgotten, yeah. but I, I, and, and, I, I had to say it, but I'd forgotten, but I remember you talking. You remembered about that. it. That's good. That's good. And then also, what do I need to know and what do I need to share? And the thing about veteran operators is that they will not know what they need to know because they already know it. But if that's you right. say, what do you need to share? Dozens yeah, right. and dozens of things. And always take the information. You might have a whole list of things you want to share. And you and you say to the operator, okay, let's turn them into visual devices. Yes. Just yes. start with one, then do two. Yep. Now you've got 10. And what that's do essentially I need to know? What's what do I need to Josh. share? That's, mm -hmm. essentially that's exactly what's happened right. with Josh. He's now developing further, but he started with that one. That's exactly what happened with him. But he, he, my, my, my hesitancy with Josh is he's the supervisor. He's got a whole other yes. set of questions about scheduling and yeah, deadlines and material. Turn that over to his operators and you've got two humming machines instead of just one. So yeah, very valid. Josh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Very I really, um, you know, you, the organization wants to learn and part of the wisdom of a transformation is to say who owns this question who is the yes. real owner hmm? Very valid point. yes okay we, need, we need to move that thinking down to the that's right. uh, uh, that sounded disrespectful we needed to we needed we need to move the josh thinking to the operator level i've got yes. no arguments with that Gwen. yes but also the questions about senior leadership if we can get executives to own those questions, to realize yeah. that there are visual counterparts. Yeah. You've got supervisors speaking a language that everyone understands because it's visual. You have the CEO, you have the plant manager, you have the operators, you have a workplace that speaks. I'm anxious to get to the answer to the question of what's different with lean, and, but we can do that in two sentences. Let me show you another one, procedural standard. So that is the how. How do you put the technical standard in place? What's your SOP? Yeah. And, you know, these are the how to weld a support, a, a core support, how to wrap a wiring harness, how to lubricate, et cetera. How, how, how. And here's a really great example. These terminal endings uh, they're for wiring harnesses in automobiles. When the, this was pre-computers, but the example is fantastic. And if you hit the end of the this very delicate ending, this terminal ending, it'll bend and you won't be able to use it. So the SOP was: uh, don't bang the uh, the endings on the floor. That was the SOP. Make sure not to bang it. And they were stored here. But you know what? Sometimes I bang it. So I need some help. I know you don't want me to, and I don't want to either, but sometimes I make a mistake or can you help me remember? Yes. 
let's do it visually. And here's how they remembered. They just put a red mark. That's it. The operators did that. And I will tell you, this is 1986 Rio Bravo 4, the first uh, Maquiladoro plant in Mexico, right across the river from, from uh, not Juarez, it was in Juarez, the sister city in Texas, El Paso. How brilliant. This plant had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of visual devices and what's so very interesting. I, I want to tell you one more thing about um, visual standards in a moment, and I'll be using Rio Bravo uh, for that as well, is that Rio Bravo was um, part of the Packard Electric Group that's eventually became Delphi and now is kind of owned by Autoleave. But they were schooled by Sumitomo. And this is so interesting about the Japanese. The Japanese actually don't have a quadrant of knowledge called the visual workplace. They have bits and pieces. They have andon, they have judoka, they have kanban, they have color coding, but they haven't made it uh, a paradigm of change. That was, that's been my job to put that into methodologies, into principles. And so these devices happened because Sumitomo was the driver, but it wasn't codified into a methodology. Nonetheless, they're everywhere. So anyway, those are two examples. The, the Japanese knew that visuality was important, but because they didn't separate it from their production system, the West is very slow in catching on. It only needs to have a little shift in thinking and you're home free. You have, there are methodologies, but you get the concept and you know when it's missing. Hmm. I th Mark Rosenthal made a comment to me uh, in one of his clips about a year ago where he talks about conscious awareness. That's and to it, make yes. something work, you have to first become consciously aware of it. What I think you help us to do, Gwen, is become consciously aware of um, all this stuff that you're talking about. May it I doesn't happen a... automatically. You have to become conscious aware. You have to be, uh, raise conscious awareness. And I think that's what you do really well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oscar. But the thing that's so interesting about your comment is to marry it to what we know about brain function, which is the brain needs it. The brain needs visual information to feel safe and to function, to really to function. There's much to be said about it, but let's just take that as a given. And yet our workplaces have been, have come up over the last hundred years without visuality. It's because the people who made the workplaces, Taylor and Ford and the other greats weren't thinking visually because even though they needed visual information, they didn't know about visual devices. They didn't realize that was missing. They were focusing on other things. What kind of a machine is needed to make a, a fender? How do I get the attributes closer? They weren't thinking visually because they were in the development of, developmental stages of manufacturing. Yeah, right. But we are mature enough now to say to ourselves, this is a missing piece. And I'll just give you two questions because there are people out there listening with us today who um, will be able to use these questions. They're consultant level questions. This will sound familiar to you. Oscar as well, you stand at the threshold of the factory, the visual thinker, the visual master does, the visual thinker in the making does and says, what am I seeing? What does it mean? And you scan, what am I seeing? What does it mean? That's the first question. The second question is, what am I not seeing? What does it mean? And when, what am I not seeing? What, I, what am I seeing? There, the gap becomes so apparent. I am not seeing information. I am seeing machines. I am also seeing cleanliness. I am also seeing order, but I am not seeing the workplace speak to me. I'm not seeing information. And therefore I'm going to have to ask questions or make stuff up. And I Both think that gets to the point of that standardized work is not a pile of documents on people's desks. That's right. That's right. 
That's right. Yeah, good. So, Gwen, That's we've right. got nine minutes left. Yes, uh, I did. Which is fine. I want um, to I want to share two things with you, if I yes. may. Yeah, Thank please. you. I I I want to share this with you. Pardon me again. You're seeing the answer before. I so no, this is good. I, you're doing okay, very you. well with the technical. You're doing. I know you're a bit nervous about that. You're doing very well. I'm not nervous. I'm clumsy. I, I, <laughs> Sorry, I'm not nervous about all right. at all. I just don't know how to. I'm not skilled. I need a standard. You're nervous about being clumsy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll agree to that. I am apologetic about being clumsy. Um, so here. Okay. We are again at Rio Bravo 4, and you can see the complexity of the electrical harnesses. And this woman is, is, is assembling them. And there are lots and lots of visual devices that you can see on her board to help her do the right thing. There are also flat standards, two-dimensional informational standards. And I want to make a point here about standards that I've discovered that I think can be very helpful to your uh, to people who've joined us today. This is a flat standard. Notice the date, 1986. I love this standard. And it's about the right and the wrong way of putting on the electrical tape. Forget about that this was 1986. This has relevancy now for how you do your standards. Well, as you see, it's very visual. And you see that it is showing you how to tear the tape. It's showing you how to hold the tape. What this standard is, is called the tricky parts. And I want to invite you when you do your TWI standards to have your supervisors and your operators and your veteran operators say, what are the tricky parts? Yes. Because we need to know what where we're going to fail as compared to this standard, just a moment, which gives you the whole SOP. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is the wide focus and it's very important, but this tricky detail yes. is so useful. And you know what else? One of the challenges about standards or about a workplace that is just beginning to be interactive, participative, and includes the operator is how do you make standards interesting after they've been made? How do you motivate people to actually engage in the standard and get closer and closer and closer to the perfect outcome? Sure. This is the way, one of the ways we do it. The operator and the supervisors and the, the managers, engineers who help on the standards start putting these together and make a collection of the tricky parts and they're laminated and then they're put into a sleeve. And the supervisor does request this of the operators. Okay, this week we're going to be working on this detail and everybody puts it up on their little clothesline or as you get more uh, uh, expert, I want you to perfect something this month. So pick a standard, here's an array of 50, go after one of them and execute it perfectly. That gives the operator a chance to be self-selecting, to decide what do I want to work on, and then to have this relationship to, for this one detail to do it better and better and better so that I really have knocked it, knocked it on its head. Because the thing about, about the whole TWI visuals uh, standard program is that it needs to be infused with the life of the human. It, sure. it can't just be, so I wanted to share that. At, no, no, at, I think that's good. Just hold that because for those of you, mm -hmm. those people who are listening who've got a TWI background, particularly job instruction, I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of opportunity to make our key points visual. So we tend to, you know, our important steps, key points and reasons why are written on a piece of paper. What I believe, and we've done it in the, and we've done it with at the winery, is there's a huge opportunity to make the what would what is normally a written key point uh, to make the written key point visual, which is essentially what you've done on the left hand side. So that's yeah. where it fits, it fits perfectly with the with the TWI and job instruction thinking. No yes, doubt about yes, it. it's a wonderful no extension. It. Yes. Shall I answer the question about lean and visual now? Yes, you could, and you've right, got thank you. four minutes to do it, or three. Oh, yeah, sure, we can do it in one. If 
If I may interject yes. just really quick, we do have four questions that have come through in the question and answer box as well. So I don't know if you, I don't I'm know. Happy how to stay later. Those. I'm happy to stay. Okay. We'll yeah, answer I, them all. Shall we answer we them all, stay, Oscar? We, yes. We'll see how we go. I think what okay. we can do, Gwen, is do another one of these down the track. Good idea. <laughs> but let's Good see idea. how we go. Let's all right. Do thank the you. Lean Th one thank you very much, Amanda. Thank sure. You. So the difference between, uh, let's see, I'll open this up. Stop share, there we go. The difference between visual and lean is pretty black and white. Think of two wings of a bird. One wing, and I'll call this the lean wing, is about time. Lean is, about, is a time-based strategy. It is about pull. It is about the critical path. It's about time, the critical path, and pull. Okay, very clean, very distinct. This was given to us by the Japanese. It's not changed. That lean has become the alphabet soup of all things to all people is, is just making it a bit muddy. So the way that I define it is critical path, pull, time, time-based strategy. It's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to do lean in a depot because in a military depot, you're taking everything apart, time disappears. What you need is information. And that's the other wing. The other wing, the second wing of the bird is about information. It is about adherence. What a perfect fit with TWI. It's about adherence. It is about flow. You can establish flow strictly by doing visuality. Flow is one of the major outcomes of your transformation. It's a milestone. This wing is about information. This wing is about time. Two wings of the bird. Which wing is more important? Well, the bird will tell you because it'll fly off. The two wings will be in balance. The bird will get to its just destination and it doesn't even recognize that as a legitimate question. It just says, oh, those humans, they're so confused. <laughs> Why are they asking me this question? <laughs> Why do they ask me what I like to eat? <laughs> it's perfectly obvious. I need both wings. Yeah, and so, so many of the work. The other. It's not, it's one, not or one or the other. other. No, it's again, because the people who brought this over to our wonderful United States and the wonderful West, didn't have an understanding then of why it was important to recognize time-based strategies as compared to information-based strategy and not to ask which is more important. You have two We're shaking hands. It's like that. Very, so, very important. Thank you. When for we do question. need to, there's, there's, there's four questions, but they are very broad and we're not gonna try and answer those now. Oh, there's one right. that's not broad Mm -hmm. um, and that is from John Barrett. He says, where can I find more information on visual workplace implementation? Yes, thank you. So there, there's the website there. That's Gwen's website, John. Can I say w something? W yes, I say please. Something? No, okay, go, go, so visualworkplace.com is full of free material. There's like 300 podcasts. I talk about all this stuff. I think we have 50 of them up. There's 200 articles. Uh, we have a newsletter. There's a place to sign up for our newsletter. We are going to do a newsletter on standardization in honor of Oscar uh, for October. And we deliver services in all of this. We deliver the webinars and we have materials. So there's every, you know, just drop us a, drop us a line and we can get you more. But it's a very rich field. And I'm glad somebody asked that question because I've been studying it for almost 40 years and it keeps telling me things. It keeps informing me. It's alive. It's alive. It is not an engineering outcome alone. It is an engineering and human outcome. It's a wonderfully rewarding. I hope you I, I pursue it. I think, I think that's the most, the most important thing you said there, engineering and human outcome. The human outcome, what I, my view is that's about 90% of the value of it sits there. 10% of it's engineering. You, it's Oscar, all yeah. about it's all about the human and helping life easier for them. And yeah. as to your first point, 50% of the information we take in, so how can we make that the right 50%? How can we make that easier for the human being? I That's love almost what you said right. There. You almost got it right that time. Pretty darn close. <laughs> Pretty darn close. You come right. back the next time. <laughs> 
Gwen, thank you for this. Thank you I so really, much. Really, I loved I knew, it. I knew I would enjoy listening to you again, and I oh, certainly and did. You. And Very me. much appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And um, I'm going to talk to Gwen about doing a follow-up one for this yes. in uh, a few months' time. And I want to thank everybody uh, and Jim, who is uh, the head of uh, Lean Frontiers, for the invitation. This has been a joy. And Oscar is a very good buddy. And it's wonderful. Good on you. you all right. All the best, everyone. And thanks, Gwen. My pleasure. And we'll see you. We'll talk soon. Thanks. Bye.